Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome you again to our ongoing discussions on the Lectures on Faith. Joining me for our discussion this session are a distinguished group of panelists. Opposite me, Professor Robert L. Millett, Professor of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University and former Dean of Religious Education. Professor Robert J. Matthews, Professor Emeritus of Ancient Scripture and former Dean of Religious Education. To my immediate right, Professor Jeffrey Marsh, Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. And I'm Andrew Skinner, also of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. Uh, we, the last time we talked, we were in the middle of a discussion about Lecture 5, Lectures on Faith, the shortest but uh, perhaps the most challenging of the lectures the importance of the subject uh, really speaks to the heart of the gospel and that is uh, the nature of God the Eternal Father, His Son Jesus Christ the, and the Holy Ghost, the Godhead but also the fact that they are unified and uh, because they are unified in a way that we can't sometimes understand or think of uh, there are occasionally some challenges raised about uh, this lecture. Um, Brother Matthews, you made a, an, an important statement, I think, last time we met that I think maybe should be our jumping off point for our continuation. Well, thank you, Dean Skinner. I'd like to make two points which I think are related and uh, one is based upon the other. At the uh, conclusion of Lecture 3, uh, we have this statement. Let us here observe that the foregoing is the character which is given of God in his revelations to the former day saints. It is also the character which is given of him in his revelations to the latter day saints. So the saints of former days and those of the latter days are both alike in this respect. The latter day saints have as good grounds to exercise faith in God as the former day saints had, because the same character is given of God in both. That being the, the concept, then let's go to the next statement that you referred to. In the uh, seventh lecture on faith, which we will come to uh, soon, uh, the prophet is discussing the idea of um, what did the Lord propose when he proposed to save mankind. In other words, what is a saved person like? And then um, the lecture makes this statement that the great prototype of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and to be saved is to be precisely what he is and nothing less. Now, we know quite a lot about Jesus and his character, his perfections, and that he is a, a resurrected being. And the, the point will be made again in the seventh lecture that Jesus is the great prototype or prime example of what a saved person will be. Later in that same lecture, as a type of review, it says the Father is the great prototype of salvation. Now those are not contradictory, they're simply saying what the one has, the other has. And I, I wanted to make that point to indicate there isn't any difference fundamentally in, in character or in any other important way between the Father and the Son. Including, including a physical body. Yes. The difference is that one is the Father and the other is the Son. But um, 
I, th I think it's important that we emphasize this now uh, because when we get to lecture seven, it will be easier to comprehend the significance of what is being taught there. Well, I, I see us saying then that the way we read the lectures on faith, and specifically lecture five, is that um, rather than being disharmonious with the revealed texts of sacred scripture, uh, this lecture and the others are in perfect harmony uh, with the revealed truths in the scriptures, and in some ways um, uh, take uh, open our view or our vision and take us even um, a little bit further than what <coughs> some of us have been accustomed to seeing or or reading or visualizing. Well, they're very progressive in this manner. Here is the great father, perfect in every way. Then Christ follows the pattern and becomes like the Father in every way. And the plan of the gospel is that all those who keep the commandments and are faithful and obedient follow the same path and become like the Father and the Son. So one of the keys in Lecture 5 is we need to obtain what Lecture 5 calls the mind of Christ, the, the wisdom that he has. We need to begin, as Elder McConkey said once, to think as he thinks, to try and do what he did and the kind of deeds that he did, to become, in effect, the kind of person that well, he don't, is. Well, don't we, aren't, aren't we really trying to become one with the Father in the sense that the Lord Jesus Christ is one with the Father? Isn't that our ultimate objective? That's the ultimate objective, and that's what these lectures that's, teach. And that's what, but, again, that's what section 93 teaches. After after essentially section 93, the revelation has given us Christ's pathway to Godhood. He says, I give you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship. That in the same way Christ came unto the Father, so we come unto Christ. And isn't that the great intercessory prayer, that they may become one even as, as we, we are one. Are one. one. So and that's, that's our ultimate goal, sure. Yeah. And that's true, and that's our ultimate goal, but we need to say it in two or three different ways in order to really understand it. Yeah. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, well, yes, I believe the gospel, but I don't believe I could ever become like God. Well, we don't want to be boastful, but if we believe the scriptures, that's the plan. The plan is to become like him, not only intellectually, but as we have a physical resurrected body, and as Christ has a physical resurrected body, so also does the Father have a physical and resurrected it, body. And it, I appreciate what you're saying, because it seems to me, anyway, as I read the lectures on faith, that it's saying uh, you, you can now understand why it's appropriate for you to have perfect confidence in God and have confidence in His plan and have confidence in the idea that you can become like God. It's not boastful, it's the, it's the principle of confidence on a sure foundation. There's we can one. appreciate why this, why the Shema was such a significant issue among the Jews. Now uh, the Shema is Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Hear, Hear O Israel, Israel the, Lord, the Lord, Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right. The concept of oneness is so significant, the, the oneness of the Father and Son, not just so that we can understand a doctrinal principle, but that we will understand that that is established so that we can become one like them. They become the pattern for oneness. And the pattern is what the scriptures call the plan of salvation. Yeah. There's one plan, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yeah. The way the Father became as He is is the same way the Son and the same way they now invite us to follow in their steps and to, to achieve the ultimate blessing to go back into their presence. Now, there, the, it seems to me that, that Lecture 5 does point up a difference between, uh, we're, we're talking about our ultimate goal becoming like the Father and the Son, and that it's a possibility, more, more than a possibility, uh, it should be a reality for us. But the, the bottom of um, paragraph, two. Uh, paragraph 2, but notwithstanding all this, he kept the law of God and remained without sin. Uh, it seems to me that, th that little, we still, different still must recognize that there is a, a different path that the Savior Go followed. ahead and read the rest of it, Andy. Showing thereby that it is in the power of man to keep the law and remain also without sin, 
and also that by him a righteous judgment might come upon all flesh, and that all who walk not in the law of God may justly be condemned by the law and have no excuse for their sins. That's an important principle, which is, if we had no standard against which to judge, there would be no room or place for punishment or condemnation. Uh, it could never be said, we just can't keep the law perfectly. The answer is, well, hypothetically, it's possible because someone did. So ex exaltation for us then is an eternal possibility, not, not a mortal probability. It's not going to happen in mortality like it did for Christ. But Joseph Smith said it'll be long after the resurrection when we'll complete our perfection. Well, and this gets to the issue of faith in Christ. Uh, we know that there are a couple of possibilities as to how we can make it. One is we could keep the law perfectly. <coughs> Uh, which Jesus did. Which Jesus did, but we do not. And he's the only one right. that did. But the only other possibility, therefore, is to hang on to, rely upon, lean on, trust in, the have confidence in the one who did. Yeah. And that's what faith is. Sure. Okay. Uh, complete for us the discussion, or at least uh, delve deeper into paragraph 2 or verse 2. What are the other important issues that verse 2 is laying out for us? Well, Jeff mentioned it. It's, it's uh, the paragraph begins, or the sentence begins, and he, Christ, being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and having overcome, received a fullness of the glory of the Father. Again, that language of section 93. Possessing the same mind with the Father, and this throws people, which mind is the Holy Spirit? that bears record of the Father and the Son, and these three are one. Or in other words, now we come to the complete Godhead. These three constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made, that were created and made, and these three constitute the Godhead and are one. We, we come into contact, in other words, with the fact that the thing that makes the Father and the Son one in mind, in purpose, in glory, in power, in might, in character, in attribute, is the Holy Spirit. And thus, and the extension of that is beautiful. I've heard people say, well, yes, but that, that makes the Holy Ghost into a non-personage. Well, no, we're talking about the Spirit that flows from the Holy Ghost, His influence. When Paul says and to the Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ, right. that's the same thing he's talking about. What does he mean? We have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Down we come to think of, like he does and act like he does. At the bottom of that second paragraph, it says, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness. And I've always understood that to mean that if I can obtain the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and have the Holy Ghost as a companion in my life, that the Spirit can help me begin to think and act and do the same things that the Father and the Son might do if they were there in those same circumstances. And then we're back to you possessing the, the same unity with the Father that Christ possesses it's with like the Father. It's like Alma 5, to have His image graven on your countenance yeah, is not a process of physically looking like them. It's a matter of spiritually becoming. So as significant as it is for us to, pr to pray and plead with the Lord to help us do good, it's just as significant that we pray and plead with the Lord to change our souls to such extent that we begin to think like He thinks. I, it's I it's was like the Book of Mormon says, the education of the desires of our heart. That's right. I was thinking of this passage in Romans. It's so powerful. He said, I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We know that. But notice this. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that when the Holy Spirit begins to work upon us, He doesn't just direct us and lead us, He transforms us, He changes us, so that we begin to think like the Lord thinks and feel like the Lord feels. You know, Paul also says, we have the mind of Christ. Yep. yep. That great oneness. I'd, I'd like to just, even at the expense of a little repetition, make another comment, and that is, um, the, um, the whole plan of these seven lectures is first, what faith is, second, the foundation upon which it is based, and thirdly, the effects that flow from it. Now, in other words, that is this. 
what is faith, how do I get it, and what happens if I get it. Now, all of these lectures, marvelous as they are, are building up to Lecture 7, which deals with the effects or the fruits of faith. And so if, if we learn our lessons well as we go along through the first six lectures, the seventh lecture will be a marvelous, glorious revelation that if we have not studied it, will be an eye-opener it will be a spiritual, uplifting experience. So I would say to us, let's look forward to the seventh lecture. Now, we're only on lecture five now. We enjoy the journey, but the, the, the message of lecture seven is dependent upon us understanding the first six. what's in these first six lectures. I think lecture five, too, because it is deeper doctrine, it's important for us to understand that we shouldn't shy away from doctrine. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have many commentaries, prophetic commentaries, prophetic statements on Lecture 5 to turn to since the days of Joseph Smith. But what we do have is we do have the institutionalized revelations. We have the scriptures. And I think to the extent that we read these revelations, and excuse me, these lectures, and read them and read them and ponder and prayerfully consider them, we begin more and more and more to say, oh, that's the same language as, oh, that's the same principle as. And we do have the Holy Ghost to operate with each of us so that as we read the lectures on faith or any discourse that's given, we can understand how that squares up with the revelations of the restoration, the revelations of the biblical text, so that we know that we're on solid footing. The Holy Ghost is, if you will, our personal tutor that helps us to correlate all of the different pieces uh, that we read, that we study of the gospel plan. Andrew, you say things so well. <laughs> I would like to just ask a question, not of you particularly, but of everyone. Do you consider the lectures on faith easy reading? They're ponderous reading. Ponderous reading. Uh, well, no, I, I have to be honest with you, and I don't. I can, I can, in fact, I have read them through and come away saying, hmm, what's that? Not, not fully appreciating. But it's like the scriptures when you go back and back and back, and they mean different things to you at different times because... We're changeable beings. I had someone say to me once, he said that he thought that the that lecture five was so difficult, he said, I wonder how true it can be if it's so difficult to understand. Well, my problem with that line of reasoning is, so are many other scriptural passages. Mosiah 15, 1 to 4 is not the most, is not the simplest thing to understand on the nature of Christ as Father and Son. Uh, for me, they're, they're a delight to read now, but I have to be honest and say they haven't always been a delight. They, they were laborious. They, well, were, they were ponderous to the point that I had to say, what is the point he's trying to make here? What, what, once you see the progression of the lectures, as Bob was saying, then it begins to snap. You begin to say, oh, I otherwise what you have is you have seven separate lessons. Well, and if you try to read them through one sentence at a time, uh, you get really bogged down because the sentences are so lengthy and yeah. there's so much in each sentence, it, it, it helps to take these things in packets and snippets, it's, which it's, we're, we're trying to do. It, it, it's almost like Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. I mean, you can read through the Book of Mormon and understand the stories and get the concepts, but you hit that wall of Isaiah, and if you understand and take time to really research what Isaiah is saying, you, you appreciate it more. And, here we've had a great discussion about some of the benefits and blessings of faith, and then suddenly you hit this lecture five, which is an Isaiah-type description of the Godhead and their relationship and our role to them. In fact, that last paragraph, the third paragraph, is so profound and, and sums up very clearly, I think, what the point he's trying to make in lecture five, that if we let the first two paragraphs stop us from seeing that, we'll miss the point that could get us ready for election seven. You remember Elder Packer's great statement in 1986 that true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. 
think more of, than if you studied yeah, attitudes. Yeah, more than if you studied attitudes and be, more than a study of attitudes and behavior will change behavior. And thus, if you, if you read this section of the Lectures on Faith, Lecture 5, and really begin to comprehend it, think of how it changes you. For one thing, there are those who suppose that the way you get close to God is by treating him like your chum or your buddy, my buddy Jesus. And, and it's occurred to me, especially as I read the Book of Mormon, that the great ones, the Nephi's and the Benjamin's, are the ones who recognized fully the chasm between them and God. And that ironically, the way to get close to God is not for me to try to minimize the distance, but for me to recognize the distance between me and God and that the Lord in the process... Our dependence we, on Him. And our total dependence upon Him, that we're nothing without Him, that the Lord in the process will shorten the distance. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And so one of the things Lecture 5 does is show us with, the, with, with uh, 3 and 4 is the greatness, the majesty, the perfections. I've often said I don't think Latter-day Saints do awe very well. And, and this, this calls for a feeling of awe. This causes us to look upon God and His majesty and His greatness and to see the members of the Godhead as the great governing supreme power over all things that they are and my total ineptitude, my inadequacy without their help. Can we, can we read the third paragraph at some point? We better, feel read, that read, the, we better read the third uh, <laughs> paragraph. Brother Marsh, would you read paragraph 3 I wasn't volunteering, but no, well, I'm glad to. <laughs> you, you read well, and, and I think read the whole thing through, and then we'll make our comments. From the foregoing account of the Godhead, which is given in his revelations, the saints have a sure foundation laid for the exercise of faith unto life and salvation through the atonement and mediation of Jesus Christ. See, it's interesting. That's, that's like underlying everything. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. We haven't talked a lot about the atonement, but it's, it's at the, it's at the core it, of everything. And it takes us back to the very first statement in the very first lecture. The, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The doctrine Christ. of Jesus Christ is what these lectures are all about. By whose blood they have a forgiveness of sins and also a sure reward laid up for them in heaven, even that of partaking of the fullness of the Father and the Son through the Spirit. There's that language of section 93 again, you know. As, as the Son, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, as the Son partook of the fullness, as so the, we can partake of the fullness. As the Son partakes of the fullness of the Father through the Spirit, so the saints are by the same Spirit to be partakers of the same fullness, to enjoy the same glory. For as the Father and the Son are one, so in like manner the saints are to be one in them. Mm, that's the exclamation point right there. Through the love of the Father, the mediation of Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, Spirit they are to be heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now you see what lecture five does for me is it bridges the gap between the nature of the gods to each other and the, their relationship or my relationship to them and how I can become like them and receive their fullness. The potential this is the nature. Bridge. This is the, the bridge potential nature we have. That's right. You know, we live in this fallen environment and honestly people give up, they lose hope. They lose any hope of eternal life thinking, I can never do it. Well, that may be right. We alone can't. But fortunately, there's a plan. There's a love from God, a mediation of Christ, an atoning sacrifice, and this marvelous plan of salvation that enables us to continue forward when otherwise, without all that, we would be hopeless. Father and the Son are unified. We can be in a unified relationship with them as we follow the plan that our Father in Heaven gave to us, which centers on the atonement of Jesus Christ, or centers around and, the atonement. And what gives us the ability to hope and believe and go forward? Faith. Yeah. That's why these lectures on faith are so critical. I just think that third paragraph sums up. It comes at a key point, almost midpoint of these lectures. Well, and, and, and as, the, and as previous lectures said, this really is, faith now becomes a principle of power. It empowers me uh, with hope, and, and uh, with confidence, because I can go forward now relying on the merits and mercies of Jesus Christ. But you Christ. don't comprehend that from a casual reading. No. I, I'll no. have to confess, along with the others of you, I found the lectures on faith difficult reading. I also found it worth the struggle. 
there is a there is a spiritual uplift and and edification when you reach jumped over the hurdle and can feel comfortable in reading these lectures there the, the goal the reward is well worth it you know, and it's nothing more than the scriptures say but it's the way in which it is arranged th this last sentence that uh, jeff read through the love of the father the well, I mean, what a perfect summary the love of the father the mediation of jesus christ the gift of the holy spirit we're to be made heirs of God and joint heirs, meaning co-inheritors with Jesus to all the Father has. It reminded me of the language of, of Joseph Smith's sermon where he said, in, how did he say it? Uh, Before the world was, everlasting covenant was entered into by three beings. They are, according to Abraham's record, God the first, the creator, God the second, the redeemer, and God the third, the witness or testator. And, and, and that this covenant pertained to the nature of their work on earth. And that underlying all of this, the plan, as Jeff's been saying, is the love of the Father. He has one overriding motive. He loves his children. One of the things that's been uh, sort of implicit in our discussion, but is also brought out in the, in the lectures, and this is the question and answer session afterwards, is that uh, all of these things were foreordained by the Father, that the Savior was foreordained, uh, and I'm speaking specifically now of, of that paragraph in which uh, these wonderful verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, are quoted, and Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And I guess the point that I would leave with is that this is not haphazardly put into place by our Father in heaven. There are no surprises to God. He's created the plan. He knows the beginning to the end. He knows what will befall us. He is our Father in heaven who desires to bring us to, back to his uh, glory and power. And it is such a blessing to have the lectures on faith to, to uh, help us to do that. Indeed. Th thank you very much for a very lively discussion. For more information on the lectures on faith, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.